Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to uh, the July 27th edition of Crop Talk. Uh, we are having uh, a couple issues with some of the uh, computers again, so I just wanted to. Uh, Lori's here, but she's uh, in the background, so I'm going to do the uh, the intro today. So, just like usual, if you have any questions during the uh, the webinar, uh, feel free to just to type them in into the question section and uh, we'll get to them as we go um, and again this is going to be recorded and you'll receive a, a recorded uh, uh, an email with a recording of it uh, later on uh, today or, or tomorrow so uh, uh, with that uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, July 27th edition of, uh, of Crop Talk and um, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to give a bit of a crop update um, and uh, and maybe look at the crops and the, and what to watch for for the next uh, little while here as we kind of get through this growing season and we see the crops advancing fairly fast and just kind of a heads up for uh, like a, each of the crops as to what we might be seeing and what uh, things that are starting to show up and maybe just uh, an update as to how to watch and look at look for things regarding the crop scouting panel. Uh, a lot of them are fairly busy right now uh, between uh, uh, we're doing a provincial weed survey, we're doing our disease surveys right now, and we also got tours going on. So uh, we're, uh, we, uh, we do have a few of them that uh, will not be with us today. But uh, again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to, to, to send them in. And uh, with the people that are here, we will do our best to, uh, to get those answered for you. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, start the webinar today. And uh, first of all, uh, I guess one of the things that we've all been seeing this year and what a change from last year is uh, is rainfall. And uh, when you look at our percent of normal rainfall, um, it might be hard to read some of the numbers there, but when you look at the, the very dark blue kind of portion of, uh, of the map there, uh, that's anywhere from you know about 150 percent of normal so uh, lots of the province receiving uh, large amounts of rainfall and uh, basically anything above uh, above the blue color is 100 percent or better so you know very few areas throughout the province that are, are have not received 100 percent rainfall and several areas receiving anywhere from you know 120 to 150 percent of normal uh, interesting to see a couple pockets that we are still showing uh, maybe not quite as much uh, moisture but they're even in that 80 to 90 percent of normal range which you know in a normal normal growing season would be uh, enough to uh, get the crop established and and and, and going so um, but with the uh, the normal or above normal precipitation we're all seeing a lot of uh, different things happening with the crops and uh, when you look at uh, uh, in the mornings you go out into a crop uh, crops are wet pretty much right through till dinner time and that's going to create some issues uh, with disease that's uh, showing up in some of the fields and we'll talk about that as we we go through some of the crops uh, throughout this uh, the presentation today so just uh, a kind of uh, update as to where we are. Um, uh, spring wheat, uh, you know, where we uh, sit as crop condition uh, throughout the, the, the province right now. Uh, we do have a, a few areas reporting some, uh, and you know, the difference between excellent, excellent and good condition is pretty hard to uh, distinguish. So, you know, uh, take that with a bit of a grain of salt, but you know, so a lot of the crop right now is is in, you know, I would say good to above average kind of conditions. So a lot of the cereal crops, and uh, the, especially the spring wheat. So the crop is uh, has definitely uh, taken off and and uh, and is and is, has come on fairly good. Uh, one of the things I've been noticing too is that uh, it has been advancing fairly well, uh, and uh, probably uh, the majority of uh, of the early seeded spring wheat uh, is done flowering already, uh, and we're actually seeing, uh, uh, you know, the the head starting to fill and, and getting good kernel development. 
uh, we have the moisture for good kernel developments and uh, we're getting the right kind of growing conditions. Uh, we're getting warm conditions, but we're not getting extremely hot conditions right now. And so you can uh, see that by the crop, it's, uh, it's definitely growing and doesn't seem to be showing a whole bunch of stress at any time during the day. Uh, the majority of the later seeded wheat uh, is starting to head. And, uh, and like I mentioned, a lot of the crop is, uh, is in uh, is is rated to good to excellent so you know anywhere from that 70 to 80 percent of the crop is in good condition uh with that a lot of the crop has been sprayed already uh with fungicide and we're just seeing right now uh the later seeded uh crops that uh later seeded the cereals are late, especially the later seeded wheat that is going to be sprayed so a good thing to show right now would be the fusarium head blight map And with the Fusarian head blight map right now, uh, we're showing anywhere from uh, uh, moderate uh, range for Fusarium uh, development. Uh, again, you know, it's uh, it's going to vary quite a bit from uh, from area to area. But uh, uh, I also put up a, a map of the the you know the weather conditions for today and tomorrow, uh, and uh, with the chance of uh, uh, rain, uh, humidity is going to be a little bit higher. So we're probably in a situation where a lot of the, the crop that's uh, heading right now uh, is still in the stage where fusarium can be an issue. And I think a lot of producers are, are spraying. I think we're seeing uh, a large amount of the cereal crops being sprayed, whether it being uh, wheat, uh, barley, and uh, I'm even seeing some oats being sprayed right now too. And uh, so yeah, it's uh, fusarium is still something we should be uh, looking out for. I think, uh, uh, right now, the crop is developing good enough that uh, it probably uh, is a benefit to uh, to uh, applying a fungicide to the crop. So, uh, and we're seeing producers do that. One of the things that uh, I seen when I was out in the field uh, yesterday uh, is uh, a lot of striping on the on the on this is a wheat crop. A lot of striping on the leaves and uh, Got me thinking that it was uh, bacteria blight, uh, and I uh, was seeing it on the upper leaves. And uh, bacteria blight will uh, will happen during cool, wet weather. And uh, and what they mean by cool, wet weather is at 15 to 25 degrees Celsius. So definitely not, you know, to me, 25 degrees Celsius isn't really on the cool side. Uh, but uh, one of the things that is happening is uh, the humidity is high. The crop stays wet for a long period of time. And uh, because of that, we're uh, we're seeing some of these uh, blights showing up. And uh, I think I see uh, Dave Kaminsky uh, on the call here. And I was just going to uh, stop here and see if Dave, uh, if you wanted to make any comments, have you been seeing any uh, blight showing up? And uh, and am I right with my diagnosis there? We didn't send anything away. It was just kind of from what I seen in the field. <laughs> Yeah, I turned my mic on right away, Lionel, because I have been seeing some bacterial blights and uh, even seeing bacterial leaf streak on uh, some cereals. However, in your picture there, <clears throat> sorry, John Gavlovsky's not on the call, but I think that white stripping there is more typical of cereal leaf beetle feeding. And um, maybe if he comes on later, we can loop back to it that those white strips there that's definitely i can't seem cold. to uh to hear david but oh, uh i think you I guys hear, can yeah. so um, that'd be great so you're saying nobody else heard me or just you can't your mic cut out a while ago Lionel, <clears throat> on the previous slide david can you hear me i can yep yeah. Sorry. I, I, can, I can hear you okay, so you can carry on. I haven't had any questions. If anybody can't hear, please just stick it in the question section if you're not okay. able to hear David, and I'll interrupt. So carry on, David. Well, was it unclear what I said about suspecting that is cereal leaf beetle feeding the white stripes? Yes. Yep. Okay. That's all I wanted to say for now. Okay, so we're going to go on now, and uh, we're going to um, 
also look at some of the other things that while well, I was out in the wheat fields yesterday and uh, I um, um, John Gavlosky I think is on the line and I was wanting to ask him a couple questions about the stripping uh, uh, on the on the wheat leaves and then also the uh, some of the white heads I've seen the white heads in uh, in in wheat as I also seen them in the fall rye and uh, I was wondering if uh, John if you can make a uh, a comment uh, regarding uh, what uh, those two things might be. We see them pretty much every year, but uh, just if you might want to make a few comments, if you can, uh, John Gavlosky. Yeah. So the the white heads. I mean, there's multiple reasons for uh, white heads in wheat. Uh, one potential reason is something called wheat stem maggot, not wheat stem sawfly, wheat stem maggot. And it's a fly larva. Uh, the fly lays the egg in, right into the stem. And usually it's the, the larva inside is feeding quite high up in the stem. And when, it, when wheat stem maggot is the case, what will happen is everything will be nice and green up into oh, the, the head's white, but the leaves stay green and you can usually pull that head out really easy because what's happened is the maggot will have uh, severed the, the stem inside the sheath and you can usually pull the heads out really easy if it's weight stem maggot. If you grab the head and give it a little tug but it's not pulling out easy then it's not weight stem maggot, then it's other potential causes. I know there's um, plant pathogens that will uh, also cause the whiteheads, and David Kaminsky would be a better one to speak on um, on those. Now, stripping or chewing on leaves. Okay, uh, uh, thanks. Uh... Oh, yeah, you're welcome, Lionel. <clears throat> I think you can carry on, uh, John. Um, it's all right, you carry on. Yeah, the... the, um, the uh, Stripping that we're seeing in your photo, this is a tricky one um, because I'm not seeing holes. I'm just seeing um, three dots going across the leaf. Uh, if it's holes, then we usually suspect something like bill bug, which isn't a major concern in cereals. It's just something that you see. What, what happens is when the leaf is still curled up, they uh, do some feeding and when the leaf unfurls you have a row of holes. Now this is just spots which is a trickier one. Um, possibly a sap feeding insect such as stink bugs but it's it's really tricky to say when it's just a row of spots like that. Adam do you want me to hey, jump thanks, in? Uh, thanks John yeah. and uh, so uh, the other thing uh, was out in some uh, leaving wheat, I guess now, and going into the barley fields. Uh, uh, barley crops uh, range in, uh, in from anywhere from flag leaf to early head filling, and uh, depending on the seeding date, uh, I've actually been pretty happy with a lot of the barley fields I was in. Uh, they're pretty much disease-free so far. Um, I have seen some areas where there's been some severe lodging and uh, a lot of cases that's uh, I guess a couple of factors. One factor is uh, some of the winds we've been having with uh, with uh, some of the heavy rains and uh, in, in those cases uh, it's um, uh, basically uh, it lodges more than once. A lot of times the barley lodges, lodges a couple of times from wind and heavy rain. Um, it'll uh, it the second or the third time it's not going to come up already. And the other thing too is um, in some of those fields uh, uh, we just could have maybe a little extra nutrients there, and the barley got a little bit too rank. Uh, so um, those areas uh, where it's lodged, uh, you know, tends to stay a lot wetter during the day as well. And uh, and also uh, uh, those areas are probably going to be a little bit more prone to uh, to uh, to disease. Um, one of the things I was seeing uh, yesterday when I was out in the field is I was seeing some uh, some net blotch and and some spot blotch, and I got a little bit of a picture there, and uh, was wondering uh, 
David, I see you're still there. So I'm going to ask it again. Maybe if you wanted to make a comment regarding net blotch or spot blotch, is it anything to be really concerned about? Uh, or uh, is it something we can do anything about? Or is it too late? I'm not sure whether it's too late. I would say that um, spot blotch is a manifestation of common root rot. Net blotch is generally um, favored by warmer conditions, so it might advance quite quickly. Um, but I would definitely be looking for indication that um, either one of those is, is moving up to the upper leaves. Um, I think a, a crop that's as far advanced as the one you're showing, um, it's maybe the, the headlight timing that is uh, more important. Can I just uh, loop back to the comment on the previous slide about white heads being caused by uh, fungal pathogens? Um, John mentioned that, and it's true. Um, sometimes if it's just single heads, and they are they don't tug easily. That's quite possibly a common root rot. If the whole plant, that is all of the heads on one plant, are um, are white and um, empty, I would dig them and clean off the the leaf sheets around the base of the plant, looking for other evidence of a root disease called take all. And we featured that in um, last week's crop pest update if you want to refer back to that um, what you're looking for at the base of the plant is a very dark uh, brown or even black um, surface growth and it's called plaque that's the other evidence of of take all okay good thanks david hey uh the old crop uh, Bearing a bit, uh, some of the fields are uh, are starting to uh, head out, or the panicles starting to emerge. Um, seeing a lot of really strong growth in in the oats lately in the last uh, week here. A uh, lot of huge leaves out there, uh, really taking advantage. It's almost like it's just hit that fertilizer layer that uh, was there for it. Uh, and it's just kind of is jumping. So uh, we're seeing some really good growth and some really good potential on, on some of our oats crops. But uh, uh, what I've been seeing is on some of the later crops, uh, I've been seeing uh, some uh, striping on the leaves, uh, similar to what uh, was seeing in, uh, in, in the wheat, um, maybe a little bit different, but still some striping on the leaves and uh again was thinking that might be uh blight showing up on the leaves and uh and again maybe david if you had a comment to make on, make on oats if you've been seeing something similar with the wet conditions we've been having in oats and 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 the blight yes well those uh discrete lesions that we see on parts of the leaves are very suggestive of um a disease that is called stegonospora or the septoria complex a fungal disease um, i wouldn't say that these symptoms necessarily look like bacterial blight although that has often uh, been the case on crops that have been sprayed with fungicide and it doesn't seem to be controlling it um, i just mentioned that um, we had some uh, photographs yesterday uh, from a field of oats, which had a significant infestation of aphids on it. In fact, it had been sprayed already for the aphids because it had crossed the threshold. And there was another disease affecting that crop. It's barley yellow dwarf, which in oats manifests as red leaf. That's what we call the, the symptom uh, when it's affecting oats. I can't recall exactly what region from that was from, um, John looked at it too because of the insect connection, or maybe looked at it first, and then I got called in to look at the disease. I think it was from the eastern region of the province. Yeah, that was from the Bozager area, Dave. Okay, good. Yeah, good. Thanks, John. Um, switching, uh, I guess, from the cereal crops now, we'll uh, 
we'll look at uh, the oil seed crops and are are one of our I guess biggest uh, crops out there this year at least by uh, my travels in the last uh, few days here uh, it definitely isn't hard to find a canola field uh, uh, it's almost uh, getting harder to find a, a cereal crop field uh, this year where it seems like a lot of canola did go in the ground and I think uh, if anything, the crop is sure uh, benefiting from the last uh, week of growing conditions as well. Uh, some of the crops that were uh, were good are now approaching that, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, a good to a little bit above average sort of thing. And then uh, where I'm really noticing the difference is um, in some of the poorer stands are the stands that weren't as good in the spring. Uh, they're definitely starting to fill in. And we're seeing those, uh, seeing what some of those canola plants can actually do to help fill in some of those spaces when we, uh, we when we don't have as good a germination and we don't have as uh, uh, as many uh, plants per square foot as we were hoping to get when we planted. Uh, we're seeing those uh, plants compensate and and fill in those areas, and I think uh, I think that's going to be a, a definite benefit uh, this year with uh, with especially now with the growing conditions where we're seeing. Uh, the majority of the crop is in full flower. Um, you know, uh, the early seed of canola crops uh, is uh, going out of bloom and starting pod fill. Uh, and the, even the, the later seed of canola crops right now, and uh, it's, it's hard to find them, but there's still some that are just in the bolting stage to the early flowering stage. And, um, and like I mentioned, uh, they're... Uh, there's uh, they they definitely are compensating and filling in those areas, so we're seeing uh, a lot of the issues we had this spring definitely uh, definitely being covered up and and uh, and uh, aided by the growing conditions. Uh, fungicide application uh, it's uh, ongoing and uh, we're seeing lots of it. Uh, I would say right now uh, we're anywhere from that 40 to 50 percent complete. Um, wet conditions have definitely made it. Uh, uh, where planes are in high demand, and uh, but uh, in the last uh, three to four days here, uh, because of uh, timing and conditions, uh, a lot of producers have been getting uh, uh, back in in with the ground rigs and, and spraying, and and not making that much uh, of a mess with the wet conditions that are still in the field. It's surprising how uh, wet the ground is staying in these canopies, and and. and uh, and not drying, so I could see where we uh, definitely the fungicide applications are something we should be looking at for uh, for the canola crop because uh, conditions are definitely going to be favorable for uh, for some of the diseases. And uh, it's important. This is uh, when I was out yesterday, and just uh, the importance of timing and spraying uh, your your fungicides. And I seen these uh, these plants, and I just. Uh, Thought it'd be uh, great, great pictures to have uh, to show uh, what petal drop does do, and uh, if these petals have been infected uh, or or have the uh, have sclerotinia and are infected, well, that's where your disease is going to start. And you can see where, you know, on the one leaf there, there has to be, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 petals, and if uh, they are they have disease on them, they're going to infect that leaf and and cause that leaf to uh, die off and uh, in, in some cases even uh, get to the stem but uh, some of the critical ones uh, and uh, seen the uh, one here where the leaves have actually um, or the petals have actually fallen right right where the leaf is attached to the to the plant and if the disease gets in there as the the, the leaf dries up and falls off uh, the disease can get into the stem and that's probably one of our major uh, major uh, issues with uh, sclerotinia getting into the crop. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, that's just, uh, uh, I wanted to get those pictures up there and uh, and uh, to show people the, uh, you know, just uh, uh, how the importance of timing. Uh, one of the other things uh, when I was out in fields yesterday or last few days, uh, I, uh, Notice that there was uh, a good time when you're applying fungicide and good time to be checking for unusual things happening in the field. And uh, and one of the things that uh, at this time of year when you notice some things where you've got uh, 
patches in your field that may be not quite ripening the way they should be or starting to ripen faster than they should be, uh, we can uh, start to, um, I guess, peg those areas as something to watch uh, as we go farther through the growing season. And uh, I got this example of a canola field where uh, the plants didn't quite look right and uh, an area that uh, the producer said he was going to watch through the growing season here. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, what comes to mind with this one is, you know, potential for club root. But again, it's uh, it's something that needs to be monitored through the growing season. And maybe, uh, uh, David, while I've got this picture up, if you wanted to maybe mention anything about uh, club root and maybe if producers have uh, some issues uh, about the, the lab that they can send uh, samples to. Sure. Well, Lionel, um, to date, um, club root has not generally been identified by finding patches in the field that have any visible sign above. Um, your picture in the middle, to me, looks as though that crop was reseeded. Uh, areas that are green look like they are um, mostly potted, where the ones with uh, flowers seem to be further behind. Where club root has come to light is um, either in um, soil samples, which show the high levels of spores, or through just uh, symptoms on the, the roots. And um, it's really hit and miss finding it in the fields. Um, it generally would appear if it is an area in the field around the entrance point to the field where there is uh, compaction and uh, fields that are in the acid pH range are another another type of field to uh, be cognizant uh, of club root. Of course, we have the distribution map, which is a good starting place to know if in your region um, club root has been found and uh, what are the risks. Okay, thanks, Dave. Well, while we're uh, still on canola and talking about uh, what's happening in the field with canola, I thought it would be a good time too to actually get uh, John to give us a little bit of an update on, on diamondback moth and maybe some of the tips for scouting as we're getting into that, uh, that season where we'll be out in the canola crops, not only going uh, scouting for diamondback moth, but also scouting for so for Bertha armyworms. So, uh, John, if you can maybe make a few comments on on both the diamondback and and the Bertha armyworm, that would be great. Sure. Um, so first of all, uh, we haven't seen economic populations of either this year, so that's good. Um, with diamondback, we did have, I'll call it some moderate counts in our traps in the eastern part of the province, but things were generally quite low in the west. And the reverse trend is happening with Bertha. The high ER counts are in the west, low ER in the east, but those high ER counts for Bertha armyworm are still well within the low risk range uh, as far as uh, risk categories go. So I'm not really expecting much for Bertha armyworm, but good to be looking. And same with Diamondback, um, probably a bigger risk in the east, but again, so far we've been uh, pretty lucky with the levels being um, non-economical. Uh, for diamondback moth, if you are sweep netting for other insects and you start getting lots of larvae in your net or adults, that's a tip that you probably should be shaking out some plants and uh, doing counts. We, No matter what you get in the net, you need to shake out plants. We can't make management decisions based on what you get in a sweep net. You need to shake out roughly about a foot square of plants and count the larvae. They get disturbed when you shake the plants and they will dangle often on threads. And uh, I use a canvas sheet that I shake them over, but you can use a tray or basically anything that you can shake the plants over. Um, and yeah, just uh, count numbers that you can shake out of a foot square of plants. If you're over about 20, with the price of canola being good, I would use about 20 per square foot as your threshold on average. Um, it is a nominal threshold and keep an eye on what they're feeding on. Um, leaf feeding this year will likely be very inconsequential. We've got some good growing conditions as far as soil moisture goes. So it's pod feeding that would be the concern if you were seeing a lot of pod feeding. 
Um, Bertha armyworm, you sample them a bit differently. Uh, what I use is a three-sided square that is um, 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. So it's a quarter meter square, and I plunk that into the canopy. You can just roughly measure it out with a yardstick or just visualize the area. But what you need to do is poke around under debris, stubble, clumps of soil, look for the Bertha armyworm larvae. They're nocturnal. They will hide during the day under that debris, come up at night and feed. So you're trying to count what's on the ground. So it's easier to do more accurate counts than some of the other insects we sample for. And as far as thresholds go, we have adjusted the tables that we had on our fact sheet for modern canola prices. And you're probably looking at somewhere around 15 per meter square. Um, and again, we're not seeing anywhere near that currently, but good to be looking. I'm just going to touch on one third insect that will feed on young pods, and that's ligus bugs. People will often be sweeping for them. A um, couple things to note we updated the thresholds for that one. The new thresholds are 20 to 30 in 10 sweeps. With good canola prices, you might want to go around 20. You don't need to be spraying if you're not catching at least 20 per 10 sweeps, even with the higher canola prices. The reason we needed to adjust that threshold was people were taking the old tables that we had, assuming there was a linear relationship between ligus bugs and yield loss, and extrapolating to some ridiculously low levels, um, which isn't really proper because that relationship is only linear to a point and then it's not linear anymore. In fact, when you get to very low levels of ligus bug, they've been shown to actually increase yield because the plant overcompensates for the bit of feeding they do to buds and flowers. So uh, very small levels can actually even be beneficial. You get to a point where it's somewhat neutral and then you get to a level where they can actually become a pest. Again, that level is above about 20 per uh, 10 sweeps. So thresholds have been adjusted, take note of that, and again, spray if needed. This year we haven't been seeing any big levels, so that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, good to be checking, and don't be just mixing an insecticide into a flowering crop regardless of the levels, because you do have the pollinator benefit in canola. Um, 10 to 15 percent yield boost, having good pollination, so you don't want to eliminate that if you don't have an economical insect population. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, John. Um, one thing that I was uh, wondering as well, and I should have maybe mentioned it when we were talking about uh, uh, some of the cereal crops, uh, uh, any comments on the cereal armyworm, or did you make some of those comments uh, while you were talking about the birth armyworm? Um, so cereal armyworm, uh, or true armyworm, or just armyworm, it goes by various names. It's a different uh, larva than the uh, Bertha armyworm. They feed on cereals, forage grasses, things like that. Um, so uh, those are the crops you need to watch. They don't overwinter here like Bertha armyworm. They migrate in. And what we get depends on what migrates in and where it ends up. And we have been putting out pheromone beta traps for them too. The highest trap catches were all in the east. Um, that's where we've been seeing the, the larva. There have been some fields sprayed for armyworms in the eastern part of the province, but just in the eastern part of the province so far that I'm aware of. Uh, I have, I'm not aware of any higher levels of larvae in the, uh, in, in the west. Something you can be looking for in your cereals and forage grasses, but so far it's been more of an eastern Manitoba issue. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, um, we're going to go into uh, peas right now and uh, just talk a little bit about uh, the crop I'm calling the wonder crop. Uh, majority of the, the pea fields this year just look Unreal, and actually, in the last couple of years, have done really well. And uh, uh, they're anywhere from flowering to the 
kind of the flat pod stage, as you can see in the picture there right now. Uh, later fields are a little bit further behind, but I think uh, a lot of them are are in the flowering stage. Um, uh, there has been some spraying for aphids. Uh, we talked a bit about that last week with John, and I don't think uh, we need to address it anymore, but I just, uh, there's been some spraying being done, and uh, I don't think it's been a, a huge issue this year uh, in, in most areas. Reason I call it the wonder crop is uh, the field I've been watching that got hailed out on, uh, you shouldn't say hailed out, but on June the 25th, uh, after the rain and hail and wind that went through uh, one area, and this was the producer's peas that they looked at, looked at the day, I guess the morning or the day after uh, the, the, the hail that went through. Uh, that's what they looked like on June the 25th. Uh, this is what they looked like on uh, June the uh, 28th, so they could see where they were starting to uh, almost lift themselves back up. And uh, I've been going back there kind of on a weekly uh, basis. And this is the picture I showed to them on July the 9th. Uh, so you could see uh, where all the old material was uh, battered and, and wrecked from the storm and all the new growth that was coming. And uh, this is what the field looked like uh, yesterday. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's standing about probably three feet tall, uh, it's uh, potting, um, it seems to have caught right back up with some of the crops in the area that uh, that didn't get hail, uh, you know, it might be, you know, a week, no, I wouldn't even say a week behind those crops, it's definitely um, coming along good and 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 just uh, developing like, uh, uh, well, you wouldn't know that uh, the crop had got hailed besides maybe some of the low spots where the water stayed for a long period of time and uh, there was a little bit more uh, uh, damage in those areas but uh, in general the field has come back uh, and is doing uh, doing fairly well so uh, it's just amazing what a crop can do uh, if uh, if it's uh, given the opportunity to come back and 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 grow so and peas seem to be that crop and I think uh, Dennis Lang mentioned that to us uh, when the, the hailstorm first went through and uh, I got him to talk a little bit about it and he said that um, in the plots that they had one year at Hamiota that the, they did come back and they were still getting like 40 bushels an acre. So you hate to put a, a yield on what these might do, but uh, right now, uh, uh, like I said, if I took you to the field, you probably wouldn't know that they were hailed on. Um, one thing that uh, when I was out in the field, I uh, was seeing some markings uh, on the leaves. Um, and uh, I'm glad that David and John are both on because uh, I can ask them, um, you know, what this might be. Uh, I, I don't think it's disease. I think it might be more of some type of insect. But uh, if either one of them want to make a comment on what the, that uh, scaling of uh, the picture in the top right hand corner is Mycosporella, I thought I'd put that up there just for comparison but the scaling on the leaves. So if any of them want to make a few comments. Well, I don't think it's insect related, Lionel. And the, the reason I say that we do have a leaf miner in peas that will make um, uh, sometimes wiggly or, or uh, bizarre shaped markings in leaves. But the, with the leaf miner, it, it's not usually that wide and broad. It usually starts narrow and gets a little bit bigger. So I think that's something other than insects doing that uh, damage to the peas. Well, for my part, I don't think that looks like a disease either. Um, looks like craters without any distinct margin. I would be wondering about uh, what has been applied to the crop, if anything, at this later stage, and whether there might be um, concerns with adjuvant, um, with uh, rapid evaporation of uh, the material on the leaves at the time of spraying, those sorts of things. But uh, I don't think that it looks like any of the diseases that we're familiar with. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. And. Uh... And then while I was in the field, uh, I also noticed uh, this guy on one of the leaves and uh, 
I think most of us might know what it is, but I just thought I'd uh, put it up there and get uh, John to maybe make a comment on what uh, what that is there. Okay, so that is a lady beetle pupa. So uh, there was likely a little bit of aphids in the crop, and lady beetles were probably in there doing their thing, trying to clean them up, and that is the pupa stage of the lady beetle. Great, okay, thanks, John. Uh, so let's go to soybeans now. And soybeans are uh, one of the crops that uh, love the kind of weather we've been getting. Uh, they they do like the heat, so uh, maybe a little bit warmer probably would be a little bit more up their ballpark, but uh, they still are doing fairly well. Uh, a lot of them are covering the ground and filling in really nice right now. Um, a lot of them in that R2 to R4 stage. Um, we're still seeing uh, uh, some areas throughout some of the fields where we're seeing uh, some uh, IDC or iron deficiency chlorosis, uh, but it's starting to improve in a lot of areas as some of those areas that were fairly wet uh, from excess moisture, uh, uh, you know, start to get smaller as, as things dry up. And uh, just a comment on IDC, it's, uh, it's uh, not that the soils are lacking iron, is that it's the uh, inability of the plant to pick up the iron that's in the soil. Uh, so that's why we see the yellowing of the, uh, between the margins of the leaves. You can see the, on the, the picture I put up there where you can see the, the veins of the leaves, but you see the yellowing in between the leaves. And uh, in severe cases, it does, uh, does cause, uh, you know, yield reductions and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, in, that's something that we, we don't want to see in the crop, but, uh, and there are varieties that are better for that. So if you're in an area where uh, you're more prone to uh, uh, seeing this in the field, there definitely are varieties and there are varieties that are being uh, selected for their, uh, their, uh, uh, able, their, their ability to, uh, to counteract any of this. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's there and we're seeing a bit of it, but in general right now, the soybean crop is, is coming along and uh, doing fairly well. Flax, uh, flowering to uh, pretty much uh, complete flowering in some areas. Um, I think uh, Dane Fraze had a good picture on, on Twitter here uh, last week where he took a picture of uh, uh, the uh, flax field right, right almost at ground level and uh, showed all the blue petals that were down on the ground and made the comment that uh, uh, flax uh, will only flower like the one flower is only open for one day. So uh, yeah, you can see where you know it's uh, very weather dependent on when your flax is flowering to help determining your your great yields to your average yields to maybe even your below average yields. But uh, uh, we did get some heat early on when some of the flax was uh, some of the earlier flax crops was were flowering, so maybe they didn't quite flower as long as we were hoping they were going to flower. Uh, anything that's flowering right now, uh, you definitely see the blue fields pretty much all day long. So that's uh, that's good to see, and uh, hopefully uh, there's not too many other things going on with flax. Uh, a lot of producers did spray flax again. I did see uh, I've seen uh, quite a few tracks in the field spraying for. Uh, for PASMO, uh, for disease control, and uh, and right now a lot of that crop is just uh, on its way to uh, being, uh, uh, you know, completing its season. I think one of the biggest things that uh, you do notice now, uh, and we'll probably be noticing this as we go through the growing season, is uh, is how good our weed control program was because uh, flax not being a great competitor uh, for weeds uh, as we go through the uh, the rest of the season here, we'll see uh, uh, if we have uh, how dirty the crops gets be between now and harvest, and uh, that's uh, usually a good indicator of, uh, of of yield as well. Because as it gets a little bit dirtier, you know those weeds were uh, growing while the crop was growing, and uh, they probably have will have an effect on on uh, on, on yield. I make comment on one of the major weeds that seems to be showing up in several fields, and uh, I'm seeing uh, in a lot of cereal fields. I'm seeing a lot of foxtail barley show up this year, and not just um, seeing it in the wetter saline areas, but seeing it throughout the whole field. Uh, 
as you walk the field uh, it's uh, in some areas it's definitely not hard to be walking along and find a patch of foxtail barley which uh, normally wasn't an issue so um, I think it's something as uh, as producers and and uh, and crop scouts uh, we're going to have to be dealing with over the next couple of years here and uh, I think we can maybe start with it this fall and and making sure that uh, we get maybe a pre-harvest done on some of those acres to make sure we uh, uh, start controlling uh, some of the some of the fall stuff that's there. Um, in some areas, even uh, if it's not throughout the whole field, uh, maybe even a, a little bit of a tillage in the fall to tear up some of those sod clumps because that's where a lot of times we'll see the early spring growth come from is those sods that are 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 there where all the seeds drop, a lot of the seed drops and uh, and they just start growing early in the year and it tends to be fairly hard to control uh, in in the spring uh, and uh, but uh, again uh, crop rotation is a, a good thing that we uh, can look at and I'm talked to a couple producers where the fields were were fairly bad uh, similar to this this field here uh, where I grabbed this picture um, um, maybe even uh, going two years without uh, a cereal crop on that land and this way switching some of your herbicides to be able to get some of this under control and uh, you know a canola pea rotation or something like that where or, or even a, a pea flax rotation something like that just to to uh, change your uh, your strategy a bit uh, uh, on on trying to control it because it seems to be uh, taking off in, in quite a few areas so uh, uh, kind of a uh, as we've been going out and doing stuff, uh, a weed to watch for uh, for uh, for this coming uh, this coming year and and as we go forward. Uh, I wanted to go back to uh, this slide. Uh, Dave Kaminsky had a couple comments to make regarding the wheat that I put up uh, at the beginning here, and uh, that would be the slide there. So David, if uh, if uh, you uh, wanted to add some comments uh, to uh, this slide. Well, I just wanted to ask John Gavlosky whether he thought that uh, quite intense white striping might be um, the feeding of cereal leaf beetle or not. I hate to speak out of turn, but I wasn't sure that John was on the call when I, I made those comments. So John, what do you think? That potentially can be cereal leaf beetle uh, larva feeding, and it's always um, nice if you can see the insect uh, just to verify, but by now that won't be happening because cereal leaf beetle larva should have already turned into the pupa stage. The way they feed, they're, they're tiny little larvae, and they move up the leaf, um, up or down the leaf, feeding and they leave this white streak where they've done their feeding um uh and yeah if you've got several of them on a leaf you could easily have feeding that looks like that so that certainly is a possibility okay thanks guys okay so i'm just gonna go back to the slides we were on Okay, so uh, getting to the end here today, I'd like to uh, thank our crop scouting panel. I know uh, a lot of them are doing uh, a lot of things. I mentioned that a bit at the beginning there, and I'd like to uh, really thank Dave and John for uh, being on today. They uh, definitely uh, helped me with a lot of the, the things that were going on, so thanks, guys. Uh, I'd like to mention that today uh, is the tour at PCDF and our prairies east, sorry, in in uh, in Harburg uh, for their uh, diversification center, and also tomorrow is uh, is the uh, the PCDF. Or did I get make a mistake there? Is today the twenty? Yeah, today is the twenty seventh. Sorry about that. Uh, Roblin PCDF tour is today. So if you're still got time, you can and you're close enough to Roblin, you can make it up to that one. Uh, otherwise, on the 9th of uh, August is the one in Carberry. Uh, Combine College, uh, you might be too late for registration here, but I thought I'd keep this up because there's uh, one on Thursday of this week, and I'm sure if uh, 
you uh, let them know there's the contact information. If there's still uh, spots, you could still probably get in there. So there's the contact for that. Uh, we've got a day coming up at Elder Farms by Wawanisa. August the 3rd is the, uh, uh, there's uh, the malt barley field day and uh, there's some really good plots there. So uh, definitely make your way out that way. Um, field crop production guide. Uh, we're uh, getting to the point uh, time of year where a lot of the uh, a lot of the people that wanted the book uh, have got it already. But if you're still looking for one, uh, there's the contact information for for getting it. Uh, there's also the contact information for the ag adaptation specialist. Got anything happening in your field? Uh, we're going to be a lot of us will be out in the field quite a bit over the next three weeks. Uh, we're doing, we're also involved with the weed surveys as well as the disease surveys that are happening. So uh, might be seeing some of you use out there as we're, uh, we're doing the, uh, our, uh, our surveys. Um, the livestock people, uh, uh, what a great crop of hay that's coming off in a lot of areas. Uh, so if you've got uh, uh, some uh, extra bales that you may be wanting to part with. Uh, there's our, uh, our um, um, you, you can contact any of these people to put your feed on our, our website for feed for sale, or if you're looking for feed, uh, also if you're looking to do rations, uh, these would be the people to contact. Our uh, service centers are their contact information. Uh, that's uh, the, all the numbers there. And that does it for today. Uh, thanks for everybody for working with me. We've been having a couple of computer uh, issues, but uh, I think we, we were able to work our way through it. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, uh, there's Lori and my contact information. Uh, and see you next week, August the 3rd. And uh, we'll go from there. Thanks again for attending.